Larry Skinner is um, the director of the Worker Institute's uh, Labor Leading on Climate Initiative at Cornell University. Uh, you know, the left are asking now, how do we get workers and unions to support a Green New Deal? How do we get buy-in? So our guest tonight has been in the thick of it, working to do this for many years and having a lot of success. So thank you so much for coming on, Lara. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of Great course. Great to be here. Um, so let me start out, you know, I've heard you describe like how the coalition kind of came together in New York in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, not that there wasn't anything going on. Before, but can you kind of describe like hurricane, what was the effect of Hurricane Sandy and how this coalition of unions and environmentalists started getting together? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Paul, I mean, basically I had done a lot of work with unions around climate change in the past, but I just felt like something really shifted when Hurricane Sandy hit downstate New York and Hurricane Irene hit upstate New York. And it really presented mm -hmm. a different opportunity um, to work with New York unions and, you know, many of whom are the largest, you know, union locals um, in the country. And as, you know, you all and probably many of your listeners know, Sandy was a monster historic storm. It did so much damage. We're still trying to rebuild and recover from that storm. People lost their lives. Nine million people lost power. $65 billion worth of damage done. Um, and it just really sort of changed the level of consciousness, I think, among New Yorkers and among the labor movement around climate change, right? It was no longer something of the future, something that's down the road that's going to happen. It's, you know, it's here now. It was really damaging. And we want to do what we can to make sure that we can do as much as we can to avoid um, future storms like this. And I think for the labor movement in particular, you really saw a lot of union members on the front lines of dealing with um, these storms and climate change and extreme weather events, right? You had union members like nurses from the New York State Nurses Association who were carrying patients by hand downstairs because the power was out and elevators weren't working and patients had to be evacuated from buildings. Um, you had transit workers trying to get trains and buses um, out of flooding's way and, you know, to safety so that they weren't destroyed. Um, you had um, public sector workers who work at wastewater treatment plants who were stranded at those plants because they were flooded um, and they couldn't get out. Um, you had utility workers who were trying to um, repair power lines in really dangerous situations. Schools, right, for the teachers um, union, schools became shelters um, in the aftermath of the storm. And, you know, some of you may know that AFSCME DC 37, they were out of their office for over a year because their headquarters um, sustained so much damage from the storm. So I just felt like it really sort of changed the conversation around climate change and really made it um, uh, real in a way that it hadn't been before. I think the other key part was that it really exposed and exploited the stark inequality that exists in New York and around the country, right? It was working families, women, communities of color, immigrants, the elderly, who were hurt first and worst, right? It's those who have fewer resources to recover and adapt uh, to climate change and extreme weather events who really sort of bear the brunt of storms like Sandy and climate change in general. And we're just seeing this more and right, more and more, right? Like climate change exacerbates existing inequalities. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, coming out of the storm, of course, there was a lot of interest from the environmental and climate and climate justice movements. Um, to focus on moving really ambitious climate action in New York State it made a lot of sense, right? Like we just got hit by this big storm. What is New York State going to do to deal with climate change and reduce emissions? We also at that same time started to see a real uptick in solar and wind work. Um, but as you all just mentioned earlier, most of the work's non-union, right? Um, unionization rate in wind is 4% right now. Unionization rate in solar is 3%. Um, it's even lower in energy efficiency. You look at traditional fossil fuel power generation, coal, oil, and natural gas, we're talking about 10 to 14% unionization rates, right? Quite different. Um, so, you know, what I did is I, I sort of saw this opportunity. I thought rather than the labor movement being sort of reactive to what the environmental and climate movement is proposing around how to deal with the climate crisis, what if we convened a bunch of unions um, and thought through what would a positive, proactive, pro-worker, pro-union climate agenda look like? How can we really sort of tackle the challenges that this transition to a low carbon economy is going to present for workers and the labor movement and also seize the many opportunities we know that are going to be there, right? A lot of studies are saying now we're going to create 25 million jobs in the clean energy economy between now and 2050 um, to, to build this climate friendly econ economy and to deal with the climate crisis. 
And so, you know, just in terms of the process, you know, I worked with the New York State AFL-CIO, the Building Trades, the New York City um, Central Labor Council, and about 20 local unions um, to launch this process. It was a multi-year process. It was multi-dimensional um, and iterative in the sense that we were doing interviews, we were doing research work, we were doing policy development, we were doing training and education with both leaders and members of unions, bringing that all together. And we started at the very beginning, Climate Science 101. What is the climate crisis? What's causing it? What are the impacts that are we seeing? Uh, what impacts can we expect to see? What do we need to do to address climate change? How do we reduce emissions, You know, um, both nationally, but also in New York State specifically? And how do we really do this at the scale and pace that the climate crisis dem demands? Because that's the big issue, right? We've got some good programs here and there, but most of them are not being done at scale to really sort of deal with the climate crisis and um, create you know, significant um, uh, numbers of jobs. And so we met every few months. Um, by the end of the process, we came up with what we called climate jobs recommendations. I think one of their strengths is, strengths are that they're very um, concrete. Um, we called it a climate jobs program for New York State, and we really sort of went for the sweet spot of how do we get the most emissions reduction, how do we get the most union job creation, what investments do we need to make to build more resilient and equitable communities and support frontline communities that have been most impacted by climate change and environmental injustice. Um, and after we came up with that set of 10 recommendations, the unions that were involved um, decided to launch their own organization. They sort of said, this is a great idea, great report, but, you know, as good trade unionists, we know that if we're going to win any of these, um, uh, you know, policy ideas that we've come up with, we've actually got to run campaigns. We've got to run, you know, um, corporate campaigns, political campaigns, public campaigns, legislative campaigns, um, and make this climate jobs uh, plan a reality in New York State. And I'm really happy that, you know, because of the success that we've had in New York, a number of the labor leaders that were involved in that work have now gone on to set up something called the Climate Jobs National Resource Center. And um, we're the academic and educational partner to them that are actually helping coalitions of unions and in some cases, in some cases coalitions of unions and environmental groups um, develop these similar uh, pro-worker, pro-union climate jobs programs. And as I understand it, you know, it seemed like you were very deliberate about first um, getting union buy-in first and kind of, I don't want to use the word excluding, but like, you know, not really worrying about environmental groups necessarily getting the unions on board first and the buy-in. Yeah, our process was different for a couple of reasons. One, as Paul said, it was a union only process. We only brought unions together to develop these climate jobs recommendations. The other thing I would say is that we um, really worked hard to prioritize and center um, building trade and energy unions in the process. Um, they were the first unions that we sort of recruited into this convening. In the end, you know, it was a very sort of broad coalition representing um, nearly all the different um, uh, parts of the labor movement in New York State. But I felt that given the contention over uh, climate um, issues in the U.S. and, you know, around the country in different states, it was really important to dig into the unique challenges that particularly building trades and energy unions face um, in dealing with the crisis and making this transition. Um, you know, and I just think sometimes you got to do that work within the own within your own house of labor before you can be a better partner and sort of ally to other social movements. And like I said, you know, I think there's just some really unique challenges that unions face in this transition. We can talk more about job loss. Um, you know, and also there's a lot of unique opportunities for, mm -hmm. for labor as we make this transition. And we just really wanted to be able to dig into both of those things. And, you know, as you both know, there's a lot of concern on job loss, um, you know, as we make this transition. Um, you know, you all mentioned earlier, if you look at the bigger context of our economy in the U.S. and not just talking about climate and clean energy, the vast majority of new jobs that are being created in the U.S. are low wage precarious mm -hmm. jobs. So you think about making a transition right now and you have a high school GED and you're making, you know, uh, over a hundred thousand dollars have good benefits and you're talking about your job disappearing. You wonder, is there going to be a job that's just as good to transition to? So I think, you know, there's that. And there's the fact that just transition programs, we've tried them in the past in the U S it's not like this is a new thing. We tried it for, you know, um, 
uh, forest workers in the Pacific Northwest. When we stopped doing old growth logging, we've tried it for trade affected industries like the steel industry. Um, we had a GI bill, which was in a form, a just transition. And generally, and all of the sort of analysis of these just transition programs in the past have shown they don't um, have the breadth that they need in terms of reaching the, the, um, the breadth of workers who are really sort of impacted by these economic transitions. They don't provide the depth of support. They're typically not well-funded enough to provide the depth of support that workers need. And, you know, ultimately what happens is workers who have lost their jobs don't end up in jobs that pay as much or better than their old jobs, right? Their lower right. quality jobs. So, and I think like the last thing I would say about that is there's a lot of talk among policymakers and within the environmental movement about how many jobs the clean energy economy can create, but it's often pretty superficial in terms yes. of have those jobs actually been created? You know, and often the case is changing a little bit now, but often the case is no, because we're not in climate work at the scale that we need to do it. We're not making the investments in the clean energy economy that we need to, to see significant levels of job creation. And then the issue of the quality of the jobs that are being created, you know, is not given nearly enough attention. And the reality, as we said before, is that most jobs in solar, wind, and energy efficiency are not good jobs. They're low wage, low quality jobs with few or no um, benefits. So I think, you know, my thinking was, um, of course, we've got to build a big, broad, powerful social movement of workers, unions, environmental groups, climate justice groups, racial justice groups, um, youth organizations, right, the full spectrum to um, win the more um, ecologically, socially, racially just economy that we need. But, you know, in terms of this work, I felt like, um, you know, pulling together a process where the labor movement could really sort of focus on the unique and important challenges and opportunities um, that they really face in this transition was important for labor being able to develop its own agenda and then eventually be a better partner and ally to the environmental climate justice and other um, social movements around this issue. And I think, um, you know, the example of uh, the work that the Climate Jobs New York Coalition did around offshore wind is a good one. You know, one of the recommendations that we came up with is that New York State should build nine gigawatts of offshore wind, that's half of New York's power, um, uh, by 2035, and that there should be a project labor agreement requirement on all of the construction work to make sure that that would create um, high quality jobs in the construction and that there would be a pipeline through disadvantaged communities into union um, pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs supported by that PLA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Climate Jobs New York decided to make that their um, focus and they were be able to come out and say to the Sierra Club, other environmental and climate groups, you know, here's what we want to do. We want to go big on offshore wind. We need it to have these labor standards that are going to ensure that these are going to be high quality jobs. And then I think from there, it was a really collaborative effort um, with labor, enviros, um, climate justice groups that were able to win um, that nine gigawatts with the PLA in New York State. So I definitely want to get more in the kind of nitty gritty of a just transition um, in a little bit. But for a second, I want to just zoom out slightly and ask you about the Green New Deal, um, which obviously we covered uh, a few minutes ago. Um, so, you know, I, I think what I find interesting about the Green New Deal is, as I said earlier, uh, there was sort of a mixed reaction from labor, from organized labor to the Green New Deal in the beginning. Um, and, you know, a little bit of that has changed, um, but I think also what's interesting about the Green New Deal is that it is in many ways this like unabashedly pro-worker document. So I'm wondering from your perspective, do you see the Green New Deal as a useful framework for kind of bridging some of the like tensions or some of the like disconnects between labor and climate justice as they've existed in the past? Yeah, I mean, I think that the Green New Deal very effectively links the fact that we have a COVID-19 induced economic crisis. We have a highly unequal society. Um, we have a crisis of inequality. If you think about income and wealth and race and gender and a whole bunch of other um, issues, and we have a climate crisis. And I feel like the Green New Deal framing does a really good job of saying we have these major intersecting crises that it makes a lot of sense for us to try to address simultaneously and at scale. I think it's really important. I think, you know, how quickly the transition happens has been a point of contention 
um, between some parts of the labor movement and the climate justice movement. And I think, you know, that's not that surprising, you know, for all of the reasons that I just mentioned, right? The fact that just transition hasn't worked in the past, there's not a lot of confidence that that can work, that it will be well-funded, that it will you know, be comprehensive and well-coordinated, um, that'll really reach the breadth and depth of workers that it needs to reach. And as long as we're, you know, in a landscape where the vast majority of new clean energy jobs are largely non-union, um, you can understand why the kind of, um, you know, the pace of that, that transition is concerning. And I think, you know, that's really, you know, why I'm doing the work that I'm doing with Climate Jobs New York and the Climate Jobs National Resource Center. We're really focused on how do we advocate for, for bold, ambitious climate policy and make sure that they're really, you know, dig into the nitty gritty of how do we make sure that there are appropriate equity and labor standards built into, into this clean energy work from the very beginning so that we can demonstrate that we can create high quality union jobs in these new sectors. And I think, you know, as we all know, if we don't do that, we're going to replicate and actually worsen a lot of the inequalities that um, exist in our current economy and, and society. So I guess a follow up from that is, um, is the Climate Jobs New York program that you outlined, is that scalable to a larger or national level? And then um, I guess following from that, like what are some other uh, kinds of policies or um, uh, initiatives that can ensure a just transition and can, um, I guess, guarantee or like at least get green jobs on the road to being good jobs as well? Because I think, you know, probably, probably lots of, probably everybody who is invested in the Green New Deal, um, uh, supports the idea of a just transition, but as you were just saying, it's so much easier said than done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we are really trying to to figure out how we implement solutions that are scalable. Um, I would say, you know, um, in terms of what we're doing in New York, what's sort of applicable to the to the national level. Um, I would say, like the approach. I think there's a lot in the approach that we have that's really important to take to the to the federal level. I mean, the the way that we think about this work is that we're dealing with two crises, not one, right? We're dealing with a climate crisis and we're dealing with a crisis, crisis of inequality and the solutions have to be taken on both of those things. I think that's like a really key thing. You know, I've done a lot of work with um, the agencies in different states that are tasked with developing renewable energy and, and the clean energy economy. And I have to say that you know, a lot of their orientation is that their job is to reduce emissions and that's solely their job, right? Um, and I think we, we want to reframe that, right? That that we build, we need to build this clean energy economy. Yes, we need to reduce emissions, but we need to do it in a way that's dealing with inequality, that's creating high quality union jobs, that's making investment in frontline communities. So I think that that reframing and reorientation is important and really applicable to the federal level. I think the idea of, of uh, developing recommendations that are really jobs and investment led, right? Like how do we get the most emissions reduction and the most union job creation and talk about it in a really concrete way, right? You often hear, you know, folks from the, the traditional environmental movement talking about a 25% reduction below 1990 levels by this date. And I think what we tried to do is talk about how do we get to 100% renewable power, but what does that mean? What do we need to build? How much solar do we need to build? How much wind do we need to build? How much is it going to cost? How many jobs are going to be created? And what sort of um, labor and wage standards need to be built into that so that we can make sure that these are going to be um, really good, high quality jobs? Um, you know, and that's what we, we, we did in New York. And I think, you know, the other thing that we're really sort of thinking about that's important on the, on the federal level is how do you really sort of use climate policy to drive job creation and economic development? You know, building offshore wind farms is great. There's going to be a lot of construction work from it. The vast majority of jobs are in the manufacturing and assembly of offshore wind um, turbines. And so that's like another place where in New York, um, uh, Climate Jobs New York, the Coalition of Unions has really been pushing, you know, how do we have targets for how, uh, what, what percentage of the manufacturing content is going to actually be produced regionally? Um, and in a low carbon way, right? How do we secure that? And then how do we have labor peace and neutrality um, on this, you know, permanent non-construction work so that workers can have a democratic and collective voice on the job? Um, you know, so those are things, you know, if you think about it at the federal level, um, the agency that oversees offshore wind could be negotiating, you know, 
um, to figure out how we're developing a supply, a manufacturing supply chain for the offshore wind industry all up and down the East Coast as you have all of these states that are um, trying to build offshore wind. Um, and I think a lot of the other recommendations, you know, looking at how do we massively scale up solar and geothermal and heat pumps, how do we build out a massive, um, you know, uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure? And again, just do all of this with the labor standards that are going to ensure that these are going to be high quality jobs. There's a lot that can be done in public transit, improving and massively expanding public transit. It has like a big equity dimension to it, right? Um, transit dependent communities need high quality, um, excellent, reliable public transit systems to get to work, to get to school, to get to other essential things. So, um, you know, a lot of the things that I think that the policies that we're developing at the state level, I do think are applicable at the federal level and, you know, with significant funding and with labor standards attached at the federal level, um, it could go a long way. You were kind of anticipating uh, my next question about um, there's been some recent big developments in New York and New Jersey with offshore wind. Um, could you talk about like some of the project labor agreements there, how that came about and what you're kind of looking towards in the future? Yeah, I mean, so like I said, um, you know, Climate Jobs New York, one of the, the recommendations we had developed in our process was to go big on offshore wind. Um, uh, we actually at Cornell organized an educational trip to Denmark so we could learn about the offshore wind industry. We learned quickly from folks in Denmark that the majority of jobs were in the manufacturing and assembly um, and that if we were going to have any chance of securing some of those manufacturing operations in the U.S., um, we would have to go big on offshore wind, right? Not a few projects here and there, but um, really saying, let's let's get half of New York's power from offshore wind. We have a lot of bottlenecks in New York's um, grid um, just north of New York City. Having that offshore wind on the coast and nearer to our big urban center um, makes a lot of sense. And so um, we just felt like this was a good place to focus and um, really worked hard um, uh, Climate Jobs New York did to run a campaign to get that nine gigawatt target um, uh, in place and get that project labor agreement. And they're now working on much more comprehensive legislation that would have labor peace and neutrality um, on all permanent non-construction work in the clean energy economy, everything from renewables to electric vehicles to battery storage, um, prevailing wage on all clean energy work, project labor agreements where public funding is involved, and then um, again on the manufacturing piece, uh, how are we mandating um, that, you know, for example, when New York is evaluating offshore wind uh, proposals, they're looking at which, which proposals are going to actually do the most manufacturing and job creation um, in the region. So I think, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of great um, things happening around offshore wind and after after New York um, included that project labor agreement requirement on their offshore wind construction work, it kind of had a ripple effect. And now we have a whole bunch of states up and down the East Coast um, who have uh, project labor agreement requirements, prevailing wage requirements, um, and are looking at developing the manufacturing supply chain. So it's been a, a good race to the top. Let me know if I can get in on a trip to Denmark. Just right. saying. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious whether you see, um, is, is there is there a different process for kind of getting buy-in from rank and file workers than there is from sort of talking with union leadership? Because I'm just thinking like on a day-to-day -day level, you know, somebody who works in like fossil fuels um, who is now being told like, oh, you're going to go work at this wind plant, like that might be a radically different, you know, just everyday a day at work than they had before. Um, the wind plant might not be near where they live or like, you know, with solar, it's kind of like, well, like what is, what, I mean, you know, are they going to have to, once they install the solar panels in, in, you know, their area, are they going to have to move or like, you know, commute to, to really far away to continue doing that work? Um, so I guess, I mean, those are just, I mean, those might not be issues, but those are just like some concerns that I think could pop up. Or I think I've heard a lot of the pushback to a kind of, you know, transition to a green economy is sort of like, well, like, are people going to be displaced in a way? Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what your work uh, with kind of um, uh, getting the buy-in from rank and file workers has been like. Yeah, I would, I would say um, two things about this. One is you're, you know, in a way you're asking about the just transition. Mm -hmm. 
and I know you'd brought that up before and I didn't quite get to that. Um, I would just like to say on that, I think we have to have a much more coordinated and comprehensive approach to moving from, you know, a largely fossil fuel generated energy economy to a, you know, net zero um, renewables based energy economy. And it's a type of command and control over um, transition that, you know, uh, you don't typically see, um, you know, in this uh, particular economic context that we're operating in, right? And particularly in a very deregulated energy market, right? This was very um, clear in what just happened in Texas. But I mean, basically, um, you know, if you think about, okay, we need to get to, um, you know, zero emissions by 2045 or 2050, how are we going to do it? In my ideal world, you look at a state, you look at the map of where all of the power plants are, and you say, you look at a whole range of factors to coordinate this transition. Where are the plants? How much power do they produce? How much power is needed in that region? Um, how, ma how, many, uh, what's the, how much uh, emissions and pollution does the plant produce? How does that affect local communities? How many workers work there? What's the quality of those jobs? What kind of skills do those workers have that are translatable to other industries and sectors? What's the tax base of that plant and what's it provide to the local community? We see this a lot with um, power plants shutting down. A lot of times if there's a union involved, they can negotiate a pretty good deal for their members and they may be able to transition them to another power plant someplace else. Um, but it's the local community, right? It's the teachers union, it's the public sector unions that often are most concerned. If you have a power plant that's paying $30 million a year and suddenly it shuts down, that was what was funding your public schools and all of your public services and the jobs connected to them. And, you know, the whole sort of ripple um, of, of economic benefits there that, you know, that you lose. Um, so, you know, um, you, I think you really need to look at all of those things and then try to coordinate in the best way um, to transition um, in the most equitable way and in the way that, you know, is dealing with and addressing the emissions reductions that we need to make, right? Like we need to, we need to reduce emissions according to science, but how do we line all of that up right now in a deregulated market? You mostly see plants, just companies decide when they want to shut down a plant because it's not profitable anymore and boom, it happens. You may get a few months notice communities and workers need years of notice. They need that long off ramp so that they can plan. If you have to develop a whole new economic activity in that region to support the local community, that takes time. Um, so, you know, there's that. And then like really digging in, what are the skills that workers currently have in these sectors that may um, eventually close down? And what are the very specific skills that are going to be needed in some of these new parts of the clean energy economy? Um, and there's just, so there's just like a lot of workforce development that has to happen there that I think is really important. Um, and then um, the last thing I would say about in terms of um, speaking with members. So part of uh, what we do with our work is we're developing these climate jobs plans um, in each state. Um, after the coalition of unions um, decide what their agenda is, what they're going to focus on, for example, in New York, offshore wind, the next phase of that for us is to develop a training for union members, right? Um, so that they can really understand why are we talking about the climate crisis as a labor movement? What's that got to do with us? Um, how is it gonna impact our industries, our workplaces, our communities and families? What are the challenges here? Where are the opportunities? Where could this potentially produce jobs that I'm gonna see, right? Going to Denmark is really helpful for plumbers and pipe fitters to get inside of a turbine and see, oh, there's a two person elevator in these turbines and oh, these are the heat pump systems um, right, that I would be working on. That That's really important. Um, and so uh, we have designed, even among COVID, um, you know, basically after uh, New York committed to build all of these offshore wind projects, you still have to go through a lot of local siting issues, right, for these projects actually to get built. And so we realized it would be so important for the 250,000 union members who are on Long Island to be able to show up at public hearings to, um, to reach out to legislators and say, we support these offshore wind projects because we think it's going to deal with the climate crisis. It scales up New York's renewable power, and we see a lot of jobs and economic benefits um, for us in this work. And so we've been rolling out a 90-minute virtual training um, with members in Long Island in conjunction with Climate Jobs New York um, to really dig into, you know, why is the labor as, as the labor movement is it important for us to work on climate change, and specifically, what are the what are the opportunities in offshore wind for members? And we tailor depending on which union we're working with too.
So I want to I want to follow up on that by asking a question about um, what I think is a slightly controversial uh, energy sector, which is nuclear, um, because you know the Green New Deal kind of uh, has a benchmark of 100% renewable, um, and I think that you had mentioned that for Climate Jobs New York as well. Um, so I'm wondering how you see nuclear sort of fitting into that, um, because I think with 100% renewables, you know, we hear a lot of labor leaders saying, well, this isn't really realistic, um, and then the other sort of aspect with nuclear workers is that they are uh, highly unionized or like have, have relatively high union density. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering how you see kind of nuclear fitting into a just transition. Yeah, that's a good question. And I would say, you know, I think my answer is pretty similar to the answer that I just offered on just transition in the sense that um, I just think that we need to look at what is it going to take in each state and region to transition to uh, 100% renewables. And in some places, um, if there is heavy reliance on nuclear right now, and there's the potential to quickly scale up um, solar and wind to replace, you know, coal or oil or natural gas generation, we're going to have a lot on our hands just to do that. Um, and we should do it as quickly as possible. Um, and it may be that keeping that nuclear fleet, particularly if it's creating a lot of jobs, they're high quality jobs, it's providing a lot of tax base for local communities. That's why I say like looking at all of that stuff, I think is so important to really sort of thinking through um, how this transition should happen and how it's going to impact workers and communities, but also how do we move as quickly as possible to get to 100% renewables. And I think, you know, what we're seeing uh, most recently in the U.S. over the last couple of decades is we're not seeing new nuclear plants um, being built because solar and wind power has gotten so much cheaper. Right. And so, um, you know, uh, why would why would investor owned utilities um, be building new nuclear when they know they can build new um, solar and wind um, and it's going to be cheaper and they're going to see more profit from it. So I just think that's the reality. And then, of course, there's all sorts of other issues around the nuclear waste. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, after Fukushima, you see a lot of public opposition. So, uh, um, you know, again, I think have a comprehensive coordinated approach to how we do this transition, get to 100% renewables as fast as possible, figure out what nuclear's role is in it, and then also, you know, um, kind of look at what's happening in the energy market more broadly. Um, so let's turn to the Biden administration. Um, how would you assess generally how Biden's doing with green jobs? Like how he's talking about it, how he's approaching it, and along with that, do you think someone like Marty Walsh as Secretary of Labor with a background in the building trades might be able to help facilitate uh, some of this buy-in a little bit more? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, from my perspective, I, I thought Biden, you know, throughout the primary um, of the election, you know, kept moving sort of left on how he was prioritizing climate work, um, the level of ambition with which he was talking about um, the U.S. approaching it. I think that's really good. Um, I think, you know, centering, addressing the climate crisis as a crucial part of how we recover from the COVID-19 crisis is really great. Um, you know, New York had passed the Climate um, Protection and Community Leadership Act um, in the last legislative session. That says 40% of climate investments should go to workers who are impacted by this transition and frontline communities. Um, and, and Biden really sort of moved to that same place, which I think is really important. Um, and I think as we recover from COVID-19, we certainly do not want to be, you know, investing in a whole bunch of um, infrastructure that is not climate safe, right? That's not building the 21st infrastructure that we need to deal with climate change. So I think that's really important. I also think um, he's the first president, I think, that we've had in a long time that is really willing to speak out about the importance of unions and regularly talk about the importance of creating union jobs. Um, and I think he's, um, you know, really gone sort of strong and linking tackling the climate crisis and building the clean energy economy with creating union jobs. Um, and I actually think you know, oh, we may have a better shot at uh, securing labor standards attached to all clean energy work at the federal level than we do more broadly. I mean, that may be the place where we can win some significant, um, you know, upgrades and protections for, for organizing um, and other wage standards. So, um, you know, so I think, you know, he seems to be focusing on how do we maximize the job creation and economic development um, potential of climate work, um, particularly around electric vehicles. Um, he's really looking at how do we encourage manufacturing of electric vehicles. 
um, um, and doing the same for offshore wind. You know, I think um, his administration it is in a really good place to look at how do we leverage the high level of interest in offshore wind up and down the East Coast. I mean, really, it's from Maine to North Carolina that we now have states saying we're going to be building offshore wind. How do you leverage that at the federal le level and be really looking at how we secure, you know, the manufacturing and assembly work um, in the U.S. that would be so beneficial from uh, a jobs perspective? So on the subject of Biden, uh, the kind of controversy around the Keystone XL pipeline uh, bubbled up again earlier this year because Biden issued an executive order kind of halting halting the construction. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, some some labor leaders sort of push back on that. Um, and I guess so it seems like, you know, pipelines, fracking um, and of course, coal have kind of they're sort of held up as like the quintessential jobs versus environment sort of tension. And I'm wondering if you think that that's overblown um, or if you think that there's actually more cooperation between, you know, the traditional labor movement and the climate justice movement that doesn't get as much media attention. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of collaboration happening between the labor movement and um, uh, the traditional environmental movement, as well as environmental and climate justice groups. Um, I feel like in every place that we're working, every state that um, you know we're turning to, there's some form of you know labor enviro um, coalition. Um, we've seen such a tremendous appetite from the labor movement to work on these issues and to figure out you know what's their you know really sort of bold, ambitious climate plan and how do we really integrate it with strong um, labor standards so that they know we're going to build this clean energy economy and it's going to be built with with good jobs. So I, I, I see, you know, a lot more appetite from the labor movement to work on these issues. And I think, um, and a lot of good work happening. I mean, I mentioned, you know, the Climate uh, Leadership and Community Protection Act in New York, that was, you know, a broad coalition of unions, enviros, and climate justice groups, community groups, um, um, renewable energy advocates who worked on that. And it's a, it's a pretty, um, great bill. Um, you know, it didn't, in the end, it didn't have the labor standards that it should have had in it. And I think, you know, um, folks are now working to, to kind of rectify that. But there's other examples, right? There's other examples of where this type of collaborative work is happening. Um, and again, you know, um, like I said before, you know, as long as we have, um, you know, uh, this, this legitimate fear that we do not have a well-funded, well-thought-out um, just transition program that's going to support workers. And as long as we continue to see most of the job growth in the renewable sector be non-union, you know, we're going to, we're going to have these tensions. So uh, I think our last question is uh, what is the uh, Cornell Labor Institute? I think a lot of our viewers would be curious to know more about that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for asking. Um, so um, the Worker Institute at Cornell, we're part of industrial and labor relations at Cornell University. We were set up by the New York State Legislature in the late 1940s, um, and we were set up to provide training and education programs to unions. Um, we've been doing that since the late 1940s. Um, when we launched the Worker Institute in 2012, um, we basically said, you know, we want to kind of um, refocus our work on what we think is the most important work that we can be doing with the labor movement today. And um, we decided to focus on um, gig work. We decided to work, focus on uh, gender and racial justice issues in the workplace. We decided to focus on leadership development, and we decided to focus on labor leading on climate. Um, and we looked at all of those things, like with the climate crisis, and said, um, you know, um, this is one of the most important, if not the most important social issue of our time. And we can be a tremendous resource to the labor movement to study the labor and employment impacts of climate change and then provide direct um, training and education programs to, to, to workers around this issue. Um, and so that's what we do. We advance workers' rights and collective representation. Um, we try to reverse inequality um, by building a stronger labor movement. And we're really committed to building um, a broad, inclusive, uh, diverse, um, dynamic, and powerful labor movement. Awesome, Lara. Uh, well, that was great. And again, I think people really have gotten a lot out of this and hearing some concreteness to this idea of a Green New Deal and just transition. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.